the CPC Roof Chapter 2. And um, some of you may have noticed something kind of weird just now in the first 10 minutes or so. I was trying to settle into the message and then I realized that around 10 or 11 minutes into the thing, I was looking at the wrong set of notes. That's why. <laughs> okay. And um, because those notes are was dealing with verse 4 onwards and I, I was like, where's the verse 1 to 3? And But since I was going by the my Bible, it didn't really matter, but um, I was able to okay, bring it up and then, uh, then from there we were okay. Okay, so we're going to continue. Now, remember we were dealing with <clears throat> right, just taking steps forward, allowing the Lord to just direct and trusting the Lord in experimental faith to let God deal with things. We trust His Word, His provision, His truth, and then we leave everything to Him, but we do our part. right? Now, that's how it is in many aspects of the Christian life, including even with evangelism. right? We do our part, but we also have to let God do His part. right? Someone will plant, someone will water, but it is God that giveth the increase. right? So, we have to realize we are in a partnership with God. That's why we're called in Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul tells us we are God's husbandry. Why? Because he's also involved with this. This is his, okay, his plantation, his farm. The, the result and the product and the outcome, it's all his. Right? So now we, we allow him to work in and through us. We work through his plan, his design. And then we also saw that in, uh, in those few verses that the Lord was working through a series of events that to man, it will seem coincidental. Right? If you do not believe that there is a sovereign God and that He it works in the lives of His people, humanists will assume that it's just coincidence. But it becomes uncanny when too many coincidences seem to be happening as if some the universe is conspiring and, and it's not because of that but because God is at work. Alright, so let's, we'll, let's look at verse 4 and we'll continue from there, right? Because Ruth happens to be in Israel at the time of the barley harvest. She now happens to go out and she's looking for a field to glean and she ends up in the field of Boaz who happens to be a relative of Elimelech and now God sets the stage for a meeting. So I want to talk about the meeting with Boaz. Look at verse 4. Right? And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. And we're introduced to this person called Boaz. And in particular, in the moment he shows up on the scene and he greets everyone, we, are in, we give, get a glimpse also of Boaz and his kind character. Right? He comes and he greets them. All right, he says, now, now remember, these are all his workers. Okay? Some of them are maybe his permanent workers, others are just paid by the day. He may not even know them, but he comes and he see, sees all of them and he give off. He doesn't just say hello, good morning, but he gives and offers a blessing. He says, the Lord be with you. And then they answer him, the Lord bless thee. All right? And you see here that he is polite, right? that he's kind, he's courteous to people. And he came from Bethlehem to visit his own fields. Now Proverbs 27 verse 23 says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. So he's not just the big boss, and it's like, oh, the big boss, and he's away somewhere overseas, but you know, the, it's harvest time, and uh, you know, I'll just leave it to the workers. Now he is diligent. He goes out there, he knows what's going on. He exercises supervision, and he's not afraid of hard work, even though the scriptures tells us he is a wealthy man. Now, this is a hands-on person. Do you see that? All right? It, even though he is a wealthy man, it says, um, he's, verse 1 tells us he's a mighty man of wealth. And yet, he is there now on the ground to be where the action is. All right? And that's how he got wealthy. Hard work. All right? He came to see how the laborers were doing. He's a good boss. Okay. Now, Proverbs 27 verse 24 tells us wealth does not continue to perpetuate automatically. 
It's not automatic. It doesn't just automatically continue. Right? Just because you're born into a wealthy family doesn't mean that you're going to continue to keep the wealth. Verse 24 so it says, For riches are not forever, and of the crown endure to every generation. Okay? It says, The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are for the, are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the main, maintenance of thy maidens. But it comes with diligence. Okay? Now, when you talk about diligence, uh, we have to talk about the way we work. Alright? The way we work. And I think a very good question to be asked is, is can people know from the way you work that you're a Christian? The way you work, do you work hard? Right? Or do you only work when people are watching you? That's why Paul wrote in his epistle that he tells them, he says, those who are our servants is you know you, when we work and serve our masters is not with eye service. That means we are only working when we are seen. But when the boss, oh, the boss is out. Okay, I'm going to relax. All right, do we do that? Some people take it really slow, and then when the boss is here, oh, you know, we, we look like well, we're full of energy, whatever. Can the people who work with you see that you're Christian? Because sometimes this is what happens. I heard this as testimony from uh, Pastor Keith Taylor was that since one in one church that he pastored, the man that worked at the manufacturing plant, in all the I think nine or more years, since not a single person ever accepted an invitation to come to the church. Why? Right? Because of the way this person is, his character and the way he works. Why? Because you and I can put forth a very, very bad poor testimony before the world. Now, diligence all right, was the key and that's why Boaz is the man that he is right now. Okay? Some of us here want to be promoted. Okay? But you can't be promoted to the next level if you don't work above your current level. Wherever you are, the things, do you work at a higher level or you just work at the minimum at your level? You see what I'm saying here? You don't just get to be the boss because, well, I'm rich and whatever. Um, there has to be a certain mentality and mindset. And, and here, Boaz is on top of what's going on. He knows what's going on. He takes care of his workers. He takes care of his fields, his business. Right? Now, in contrast, you look at what happened. Naomi's family took everything they had. They went over to Moab. Right? It was supposed to be more prosperous. And they came back empty. Now, all this time, remember, Boaz and others remained in Israel, remained where God wanted them to be, and they survived the famine, and he is prosperous. While Naomi's family, they left to seek better pastures, to seek a better future and better prospects, and they came back empty. Right? Now, one note here about Boaz and and. Okay, I want us to look at this issue of character. Okay, because you can discern the character of a person by how they treat other people who are so-called below them. You see what I'm saying? He is a man of wealth. He is a man in a position of power. He is an employer of many. All right, he has a higher status than everybody else. Now, how does he treat these people? He treats them with courtesy, He's very respectful. He's polite, even though he's their employer. All right? Those who are inferior in rank or status or whatever. Now, look at Ephesians 6 verse 9, because it tells us, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. All right? How do we treat people who are unable to repay us Right? who are unable to do anything for us. Then, now let's apply that, not just to the people around you, but even to the pastors. 
How do they treat you? Because that will reveal a lot about the character and the person. Right? Boaz, in his treatment of people, you see here that he, he, had, he ex- has a very high exemplary character. Then, not only we see the, kind, the character of Boaz, but we see also that Boaz notices Ruth. Okay, verse 5. Now, it says here, And then, then Boaz said unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Now, he asked the supervisor over the reapers, Now, who is this person here gleaning in the fields? Now, he took notice of her. I wonder, you know, this is a very basic requirement, the ushers in the church. Frankly, I don't even think you really need, we really need ushers if members do what we're supposed to do on Sunday. And one of the things is what? You take notice of someone who's new. You see, what sets boys apart from other people is this. As a mighty man of wealth and he is you know, well known and all that in the town, you will notice something. If you are somebody important, if you are a big shot, you know people take notice of you. But you notice know boys, he took notice of other people. That doesn't happen in our modern world, does it? Because now, I'm, if you're big, short, you're important, you're you know, a celebrity, whoever, you don't notice other people. You expect people to notice you. And you have no time for all the small people, all the insignificant people. And here he notices, wait a minute, there's somebody else over there. Who's, who's that? Remember, there are a lot of temporary workers hired during the harvest. There will be a lot of unfamiliar faces, but he took notice. Who's that? Right? This is a man who pays attention to details. Alright? Now, whatever it was, I do I want us to acknowledge realize something also. Now, first impressions do matter to some point because they do catch someone's attention. And there was something about Ruth that caught his attention. I will put it to you, Boaz was an observant man. Okay? He didn't just Go through and then, you know, he didn't have no idea what's going on around him. Alright? Uh, now, if you want to have friends, you want to, you know, meet people and all that, realize something. People enjoy it when you are curious about them. Okay? This works for everyone, even if you are shy or introverted. Okay? I know there are a lot of shy people here. Okay? Now, you, if you take an interest about them, if you're curious about them. Now, all these things are things that you and I can do. Those who are single, I hope you'll be paying attention here, taking notes. Alright? And so he was curious about this this lady. He asked, who is that? Okay? Now, and then he Boaz discovers Ruth's circumstances. Look at verse 6. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Ah, so that's who she is. All right, and then we see here also there uh, even this head servant, right, the foreman of the harvest, then gives a testimony of her hardworking character, and she said, "I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep." So she came and had continued, notice, even from the morning until now. Now, it wasn't just boys who took notice of her. Because, right, the one who was supervising the harvest took note of her. She came, she asked for permission. All right, remember, under the law of Moses, it was her right. What did she do? She asked nicely. She didn't just come in and just join in like that. She asked. Right? She asked, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Now it says, so she came and had continued from morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Right? So she started working and she kept working and only took a very short break. So what do we see? is that something is revealed about the character of Ruth. She's a hard worker. She's not a lazy person. Alright? 
um, she may be young, but you know, she's not afraid to work. Now, do you realize for her, a woman like her at her age and all that, yeah, okay, a young woman, she, to go out into the fields, oh, I don't want to go there. It's so hot. I'll be sweaty. Sun is so bright. I'll be I'll be black. My complexion will be black. It has ruined my complexion. And then I have to glean and bend down and pick up. Oh, my back is going to hurt. Hmm? And then I have to pluck and glean all these things. It's going to ruin my fingernails. Right? I've got nice manicure and all that. It's good. It will be expensive to replace that. You know, I've got to spend so much time at home after that to fix it all up. All right? And she is not afraid to get to work because she has responsibilities. Okay? And can I say this, ladies? I notice something here. A hard working young woman who is single, like Ruth, caught the attention of this man. Okay? Boaz, who is not a rich man who is not afraid of hard work himself and she caught his eye see where you are and what you do will also have a lot will determine to a large extent the kind of person or man ladies who notices you do you get noticed in a bar in a nightclub or hard at work, maybe in the workplace, or helping your family, or faithfully serving in church. Now that, to a large extent, will de determine the kind of man who will notice you. Okay? Now she didn't go out there to be noticed. She didn't go out there with nice big head, long flowery dress, and I'm going to glean in the field, right? And then everyone, I'm going to make sure all the men notice me. No, no, she didn't do that. She got down to work. She got, okay, in the process, she got dirty, she got sweaty. Yeah, we make up, right? You're going to go in the fields, you're going to get the corn, and then we make, we make up on, right? Sun blanc, right? She'll get good. Get, she's going to get dark. Okay, she only took a short break. All right? You compare it to sometimes our, the children, young people, it, it takes the biggest effort and labor is getting them out of bed and waking up and all that. And then after that, ah, I did five minutes of my paces. Okay, I'm tired already. I need a break. So she worked in the, now she also worked independently without supervision. All right, nobody had to no, nobody had do you realize no one had to tell Ruth what time to wake up? Right? She worked without people breathing down her neck. Nobody had to tell, okay, you go to there, you turn here, turn there, go find this field, whatever. She figured all those things out. Okay, parents, because a lot of times when we get the children to do work, they're like, where? I don't know where. Oh, go there, okay. I can't see it. Do you look? Right? They open the drawer. You know, and, and they, they want us, uh, the, okay, Tr children train parents not to give them work. All right? Because they will ask all these questions. I am so helpless. I cannot find this. I'm blind. I'm deaf. And, you know, and I have no brain. So, you know, and we, they do that to discourage you from giving them work. Now, she had to deal with this very, very open-ended way. She had to go out, figure out where there's a field, what are they doing, how to har where to harvest, you know, uh, which is the best place to, to do all this, right? She, she did her homework, she gathered information, organized herself, right? She spoke to the supervisor. How many people do you know cannot get a single thing done until, unless you handhold them every single step of the way? Are you a good worker? Are you a blessing to your boss? Right? To your employer? Uh, hmm? All right, because you look at the life of Joseph, what happened? Even as a slave, working under Potiphar, what happened? 
Potiphar had no idea what was going on and everything in the house other than he was safe in the knowledge that Joseph is in charge and he's got everything under control. Wow. So people can discern from the way we go about doing our work and whether we finish our task. Now, all this is told to Boaz and he's making his observations. Other people are observing her. They're watching her. And because of that, now Boaz welcomes her, right? And he shows compassion to her. Look at verse 8. Boaz then said, Boaz, onto roof. Okay, just want to make sure I didn't skip any verses. Yeah, okay. Verse 7, okay, before I get there, remember, they said she continued from morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So she only took a very short break. Okay, I know, a lot of people, they can get in, wow, they do this, do that, after that, oh, I need a break. And then the break is longer than the time they spend at work. If you have young people, okay, you have teenagers in your home, you know, that's what they sometimes do. Okay, and she doesn't do that. So Boaz welcomes her. He likes people like that. Okay, if you're a hard worker, okay, and you're a diligent person, you like people who work hard also. Okay, they they gain your respect. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hear us thou not, my daughter. Okay, now this tells us there's quite a bit of an age gap. He's a much older man compared to. Okay, roof. Alright, ladies, some of a number of you about where I can I can see how you could be about still old enough to be my daughter. Okay? Now there was a big age gap. Boys is not a young man. What does he tell us? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Right? So he welcomes her. Right? He makes her feel at home. And then he shows kindness to her. Right? He tells her, don't go anywhere else. Right? You're welcome to glean in my fields. Stay here as long as you like. Don't go anywhere else. Right? Just follow after my, my maidens. Right? These are other ladies who are glean, okay, harvesting. Is it? You just follow right behind them. Don't worry. You don't have to worry about overstaying your welcome. I invite you to do this. Why do I say that? Because Proverbs 25 verse 17 tells us, Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee and so hate thee. Sometimes we can overstay our welcome. You know, it's nice if someone will be a host to you, but sometimes we may uh, do overdo it and then what happens? They get tired of us. Right? We overtax them. And he says, you don't have to worry about this. Right? My fields, stay here for as long as you like. Okay? Don't go anywhere else. Okay? And he made it clear, you know, you don't have to be awkward about this. I wonder how many of us make an effort to make other people feel at home to feel welcome in our church. Hmm? Maybe there's a visitor. I wonder, especially when you get long-term visitors, do they still feel welcome? Right? Are they welcome uh, in our homes? Do uh, you realize it is a scriptural requirement, even for the pastor, that he is given to hospitality? Being a hospitable person make welcoming people all right why because all these are manifestations of what charity all right christian love and boaz is showing this all right to ruth i know some of you will argue well that's because she's a single and she's a young lady and all that maybe but you will see that he's also very kind and polite even to his workers. 
It's just the kind of man that Boaz is. He shows kindness to people. Even to people who, now here's the thing, who cannot repay him. That's why you notice, you really, if you look at someone who is high in terms of status and position and power, how do they treat the people under them? How do we treat people who are unable to repay us for what we do to, for them or the kindness that we give to them? And you know someone's not in a position to give, return it back. It is not a, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Okay? How do people, how do these people treat others in that situation? And so, here, he tells her, alright, you stay in our fields. Alright, just stay here. And he welcomes her. He gives her a sense of belonging. Now look at verse 9. It says, let thine eyes be on the field that they, that they do reap. And go thou after them. It says, have I not charged a young man that they shall not touch thee? Alright, and when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So it says, she's told, all right, follow the workers around as they harvest and pick up everything that they drop. All right, it's all yours. And then he tells, he says, I have already given instructions to the men. All right, they are not to hinder you, not to get in your way, all right, as you attempt to glean. Now, because think about this, these men are paid, okay, by how much they gather. She's competition to them. And he told the man, don't get in her way. Leave her alone. Okay? Now, this is when thou art a thirst, go onto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now, only the workers are allowed to drink from those vessels. Okay? She's not one of them. She's not one of the workers or employees. But he says, don't worry about it. All right? As far as I'm concerned, you're one of us. Just drink from there, right? Feel at home, use those, all those facilities. Now, okay, I'll make some observations here as a man. Okay, this is my opinion. Okay, I'm letting you know it's my opinion. But, you know, as a man, I think boys played it very cool. He showed care, concern to a young lady, kindness. All right. He made her feel at home without, okay, now without being creepy. Okay. Um, did not make her feel awkward or whatever. Now she's a Moabitess and she, one of the things, of course, would be when you have a stranger that comes in our midst, uh, sometimes they may feel out of place. All right. They may feel that there might be discrimination. Now he, set her at ease. Okay, he made her feel very comfortable. Dale, I hope you're taking notes. Uh, mental notes, right? Don't worry, you can go back and review the recording. Okay? Now, he told her, now here's the hint, guys. He told her what? To glean only in his fields, right? Now, he made sure he created a lot of opportunities where he will see her again. Uh, uh, uh. Woo. Yes. Mm. But there is a general principle here. Now, relationships are built uh, gradually over time. Because why? We spend time together. We see each other from over and over again. That's why you notice what happens a lot of times. And they did, in all the studies, they found also that people generally tend to marry, for instance, and get together and marry people who actually live around the neighborhood more than from further away. Of course, now as the world has changed now. Some of those studies were about 20, 30 years ago. Now, uh, a lot of times, where do we meet people? In church, at work, all right? Common activities. You notice everything revolved around the harvest fields. Okay? And his invitation, his kind invitation to her ensured that what happens? There will be many socially acceptable contexts for them to meet and talk to each other. You see what I'm saying here? 
Now, years back, I read, okay, I, I read in a book, one recommendation. Always take a lot of photos, and then those were the days we print photographs. Take a lot of pictures in, in group setting, print a lot of photographs, fine. Then you have to meet that person again and say, I need to pass the pictures to you. <laughs> yeah? Opportunity to see each other again. Okay, now, I could be wrong. I, like I said, it could be just in my opinion. But I want to see here that uh, he, as a man, set her at ease. She's very comfortable. And he's very friendly. Okay? But he's not too friendly that it scares her away. Okay? <laughs> it helps when you have a very nice voice that makes the ladies melt. Uh, <laughs> In fact, one tip was sometimes be forgetful, right? You forget something, you leave it behind. I had to meet again. I need to get it back from you. I forgot my. <laughs> okay, don't forget your Bible. But <laughs> now he offers friendship to her. She's a stranger. Okay? Now the Bible tells us many things about being friends. Now, you, you and I, some of us, I understand. If you divide everybody or you classify everyone, it probably will be 50% are extroverts. And the other 50% are introverts. This is very natural. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, It's just who you are. But understand this, that it is possible to make friends and to have friends even when you are the new person in town, when you are the stranger. But you just have to follow the scriptures. Now, Proverbs 18 verse 24 says, A man that has friends must show himself friendly. You want to have friends... Be friendly. Okay? Now, it's difficult for some of us here because we are carrying all sorts of issues and problems and maybe bitterness or whatever, and guess what? It shows on your face. People find it difficult to approach you. All right? Imagine it's like, oh, good morning, how are you doing? Why? Oh, I just say hi. Why? <laughs> Okay, and I, I've even I encountered people like that even on Facebook. All right, you say hi and whatever, and they why? <laughs> okay, this is what, but here, if you want to have friends, you need to be friendly towards others. And and what's the what's the good thing about friends? It says, and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know, one of the things when the Lord Jesus Christ enters us into that relationship with Him when He saves us. He calls us friends. Alright? The Bible defines a friend's brotherly love as one who is there during a time of trouble. Proverbs 17 verse 17 A friend loveth at all times. Always. And a brother is born for adversity. If there's one thing that characterizes a brother, is what? They are there with you in a time of trouble. Right? Thank God for friends, especially godly friends. Right? Friends that we have acquired, right? Because of our common faith. You know, there's one thing that's in, in particular, especially uh, as brethren, the great blessing is this, it doesn't matter what country we come from. We can still be so close as friends. It's like family. Imagine, all because of what? We have the same blood. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Here, this friend will stick closer than a brother even closer than family. And you notice as we become adults, what happens? Friends become actually more important. It will seem they become actually much more important than, than family members, right? Because we eventually grow out and we leave fa also father and mother. But what happens? We have many other new friends, okay? Who ought to be your closest friend? Okay, on earth. It's the one you're married to. 
Okay? The problem is this, sometimes the, the, in marriage, a lot of people can be romantically so in love with each other, but they're not very good friends. Friends stick closer than family. You know, they are there through trouble. Our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself as the best example of friendship. John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love had no man than this. Now a man lay down his life for his friends. Lay down his life. All right? Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Notice here it says, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? If we obey and come, you know, if we obey and follow him, it says, You're his friend. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now, verse 17 says, These things I command you that ye love one another. So, you see here that the friendship, the bond, the fellowship that we have in Christ is something very important, very precious. And the kind of love is a very special one which is why he tells us by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have loved one to another the sad part about it is that when we look at that verse then we step back and wonder in the majority of churches it doesn't even seem to be true you, you realize that? it's painful it ought to be that, you know, our, our bond is supposed to be a very close, intimate bond as brethren in the church. How close? From the Lord's perspective, okay, we have the Lord's Supper. Do you realize that we break the bread and we eat from the same piece of bread? Why? It pictures Christ, right? His body. What we consume he is in us. You can't separate it. And He is in us as just as we are in Him, but we also, because of that, we are very closely intertwined with each other. We drink from the same cup. How many of you drink and share the cup with strangers when you eat outside? We don't. Who, who gets to, Alex, who gets to share your cup? That's right. Your wife. The people who are closest to you. Do you see it pictured even in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper? There's a very close, intimate relationship between all members in the church, you know. You cannot separate out the the, the bread that we eat and the and, and what we drink from the cup from once it goes into our bodies that oh that part, you know, that it's got to do with it. No, we we can't separate it out. Right? Oh, this part of my leg, you know, it's the bread. And that was a picture of something special about the New Testament church. Okay? It is unlike anything. The relationships in there are unlike anything outside in the world. Which is why it bothers me if you can say that your closest friends are outside. Okay? It raises up a lot of very serious questions. Now, Boaz shows his care and concern to Ruth as a man. And I will add one thing here. Man, not just before you're married, but after you're married. Okay? Husbands, I hope you got that. Alright? Because he, he knocks her over with his overwhelming kindness. Look at verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. Alright? In humility, she, she bows down and, then, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? That thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. And she says, I don't deserve this kind of kindness. I'm a foreigner. I'm a stranger. Right? I'm not expecting this. And this is overwhelming. And, and emotionally, I think, you can see here, emotionally it's affecting her. It's like, why is he so good to me? Why is he so kind? Okay, now, as I mentioned, the New Testament church is to be a place of brotherly love, right? Brotherly kindness and hospitality. Now, Hebrews 13, verse 1 to 3 tells us this let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, 
For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Okay? He says, don't be afraid right, to entertain strangers, right, to be kind to them. He says, you don't know when you are actually doing this, rendering this kindness even to an angel. He tells us here, remember them that are in bonds, those under persecution, as bound with them, as if you are also going through the persecution, as if you are also in prison with them. Right? And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Elsewhere we're told what? To weep with those who weep. Alright? This brotherly love. This, why? Because family is best. Alright? Continue this even in our midst, right? Those who are in our midst, those who come to us, even as we extend forward. Now, so much of this, do you realize if we were to do that, we'll plow and open the ground even for us as we sow the gospel. Most of the time, we don't consider this even as part of outreach. Okay? We think of things, we think of all this in terms of what? Programs. But this is just people in terms of how we treat each other. All right? To be mindful of those who are in bonds, they suffer adversity, we identify with them. Okay? So, can I say this? Because many times, you and I, we've been burnt before. But don't quit. Don't quit loving others and being kind to them. Right? Just because you and I have gone through some painful or difficult experiences. Keep going. Right? These are instructions that are given to us. Peter tells us above all things, more than anything else, we should use hospitality on one another without holding back, without grudging. First Peter 4 verse 8 to 10. And above all things, have what? Fervent charity among yourselves. All right? It's fervent. It's boiling over. All right? Imagine you, you left the pot boiling for too long. It, it boils over. Just, don't worry about it. Just have as much of it. Fervent charity among yourselves. Why? For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Okay? Now, parents, you have, you have to understand, many times, things... Uh, sometimes there are a number of issues that are better dealt with if our children now who are not doing the right thing they understand that when we deal with them but we're dealing with them with love we're firm about what's right and wrong but we deal with them with love okay instead of just being strict and harsh very often that breeds rebellion okay it says use hospitality one to another without grudging don't hold back okay now we hold back sometimes because we've been, all been burned by people who abuse the hospitality okay who abuse it okay there are brethren who uh, have horror stories where there were others who just will sit there and they expect this other brother to pay for their family and their meal. Okay? We, knew, we know one family two years in a row uh, in coming to the church camp, they expected somebody else to pay even though they came and attended the church camp and the camp fees, somebody else had to pay out of their own paycheck. All right? Don't overstay your hospitality. Don't expect, don't, okay, Ruth was not an entitled person. She didn't come in and say, hey, you know, you, you're a Jew, you love God, and, you, you know, uh, and all that, you're a God-fearing person, you ought to do this. Okay, one time we, I had to confront someone who was a staff member who had been going around borrowing money from the members. I said, you have to stop, this is not right. He said, what? This is a church, is it? We're, we're all supposed to love one another and, and have charity, aren't they supposed to do this for me? I was like, where did you get that from? Okay, 
Now, love, charity will cover a multitude of sins. Major many of the church problems will go away if there was charity. I'll just give you an example. All right, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 now, one thing we're told is charity thinketh no evil. Yet so many times, we have problems because someone was very quick to infer, to think the worst, to assume the worst, just because why? Maybe I, I didn't know the whole story from Wilson, but you know, I already assumed the worst. I point out to people who do that and say, you have no charity. That's what the Bible says. All right? Man, how many of you think that way? Oh, your wife was late by an hour and a half. So, oh, she must be out with another man. Oh, the more I think about this, the more upset I get. If you love her, why are you always so suspicious? Why are you always the first to assume the worst? Will it not be reasonable to think that maybe it's something else that happened first to give someone the benefit of the doubt? More so if you do not have the information. All right? Oh, but it must be because, you know, Goma, you know, you don't know. He, he was in his mind. Uh, he, uh, he's got something up his sleeve and he's planning something. Really? You have no charity. All right? Now, here is it. It will cover a multitude of sins. Contrasted to people who are constantly offended all the time. Now, very quick one, all right? Just turn to Titus chapter 1. Now, this is something that became much more obvious to me uh, some months ago. Titus chapter 1. Now, look at verse 15 and 16. Now, re we read this in context, okay? It's important to read this in context. Now, it says, On to the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, we're talking about unbelievers, is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Right? It describes the state of the lost. Then it says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. It's talk, who is it talking about? People who profess to be saved, but who are still lost. All right? Being... All right, in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. But look at verse 15 again. You see here, this describes the state, the, the spiritual state and the mental state also of people who are always constantly offended and always able to find fault and always able to find some form of defilement or something unspiritual or whatever, even where there is none. Okay? The disguise and what fools many of us is that outwardly they seem like they are the ultra spiritual among us. But it says the problem is because this is the product of a default mind. That's why everything seems default. Everything seems unholy. Everything seems unspiritual. Why? Because of their mind and their conscience. That's the state of a false professor. Now, going back to where we were. Now, verse 11 of chapter 2. Now, Boaz shows consideration to Ruth. Look at his answer. Now, remember, she bows down. She, all right, she says, why are you so kind to me? You know, I'm only a, a stranger and foreigner. Now, then he tells her, and Boaz answered and said unto her, it had fully been showed me all that thou has done. He says, I know about your story. I know what happened. All right. Someone has informed me about all that has happened. He says, All that thou has done unto thy mother in law since the death of thine husband. He says, Ever since they were in Moab, right? Her husband has died, right? Now, she is free to marry somebody else, and yet she chose to remain loyal to her mother in law to stick with her, to care for her, right? Remember, she's an older woman. She's also a widow. Uh, her Left on her own, her cir Naomi's circumstances would be very, very much more difficult. She's stuck with her, right? And, this, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Right? Here we see 
he he understands what has happened to her now and this is the mark of a believer or disciple they forsook everything to follow their master she left everything to follow the god of israel she has forsaken all her gods okay that's a picture of repentance there first corinthians chapter one eh, sorry first thessalonians chapter one paul wrote to the thessalonians and talked about how they had turned what to god second part is important from idols it's a picture of repentance forsaking them not by our own works however but forsaking them turning to god to serve the true and living god now here this is what okay ruth has done and boys recognize she's a young believer she's new in the faith all right there are things that probably she doesn't know but he is welcoming and kind to her are we that are we that way with new converts it's funny how you know some of the problems the biggest problems that we had to deal with was as the pastor to come in as the shepherd to protect the young sheep from being attacked by so-called sheep all right oh the dressing is like this you know if, um you know boys didn't do that he welcomed her he helped he is helping her he sees she's taking the small steps right trusting god uh, and gleaning and whatever she didn't just there are a lot of things that she could have done to take care of herself and naomi she didn't do that she did it god's way he recognized that and so what does he do he encourages her right he made observations about testimony of faith and also about test about the testimony of her love and her loyalty to her mother-in-law now think about this she's young she's available right and there's a lot of hints that, that she is attractive if there was an opportunity to abandon naomi now was the time she's stuck with her mother-in-law through the adversity so what is going on with boys he's decided he will repay her kindness with kindness sometimes that's the way we one of the best ways to encourage someone okay to encourage a brother or sister you repay them with kindness and she doesn't understand why are you doing this to me i don't deserve this why because that's grace unmerited favor you're giving someone more than they deserve all right and boaz is doing that and he explains to her all right and he understands that this is her sacrifice she's um decided to keep with Naomi in spite of the fact that having an old lady like Naomi with her is a liability to her all right if you use the reasoning and the wisdom of the world it may ruin her chances of finding another man and getting married but and worse now she's working in the field she's all sweaty dirty all that and boy says you know what? I'm going to help you along and I'm going to encourage you. Now he encourages her to keep the faith. Look at verse 12. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward is given thee of the Lord God of Israel. It says, under whose wings thou art come to trust. This is how a mature believer ought to encourage someone in the faith. Right? Instead of trashing them because it's to show, oh, okay, you're so unspiritual. You, you, you don't know this, you don't know that. Yes, they're new. Come alongside with them, help them out. Right? Instead of just criticizing them. Now, she had come to trust the God of Israel in spite of difficult and very challenging circumstances. Most people would walk away, but she all the more doubled down and she trusted the Lord and he pronounced a blessing to her on her right that how the lord will reward her for what she's done to and to keep trusting the lord okay so he did not just offer empty words 
Right? James 2 verse 14 tells us, What of it profit, my brethren, though a man say he had faith and have not works? So can faith save him? Hey, if a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, right? they, they have need of clothing, they have need of food, and, says, and all we do is this, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Right? Why? Because love, charity, has a specific meaning also because it's not just merely a love love in the form of a sentiment charity is a love that goes to work you get what I'm saying here? it's a charity that is not just expressed it is in the doing and so is this, how is it going to help? Right? now he puts in motion now a series of decisions that will help Ruth and Naomi how? To help them to help themselves. Okay? He didn't just give handouts. Right? Now, at the same level, I understand that it's probably there is some chemistry brewing between the two of them. Okay? Mutual attraction. Things that they both don't understand yet. Both of them probably are not aware. Now, Proverbs 30, verse 18 and 19. Now, I, I love this passage. Okay, there are there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yet four which I know not. This is the way of an eagle in the air. And if you've seen an eagle fly in the air, it is so efficient. Why? They hardly seem to use any energy and they stay up there for a long, long time. It's amazing. The way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and this is in the way of a man with a maid. A man and a woman, you know, it cannot be reduced down to a science or some form of mathematics. How two people are drawn to each other. The problem is in church, in our culture, we try to reduce this into some sort of a methodology. Or, you know, if you are faithful to the Lord, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this. And realize this, sometimes it just doesn't work that way. It's the way of a man with me. It's, it's just wonderful, it's amazing, and we can't always explain it. Okay? And in this book of Ruth, you're going to see this romance and love between the two of them breaks the formula. It breaks the mold. Right? And understand that the Lord can work something out in an amazing way that you and I don't always understand. Because left to our own wisdom, many times what happens? Two people coming together. What are you going to see? The people around there sometimes are going to say, ah, these two, they're not good for each other. Right, Pastor? That's what, right? Sister Maribel, that's what they told you. He's not good for you. You'll be making a mistake. Right? And yet the Lord works in an amazing way, in ways we don't understand. I know firsthand because when I first met my wife, my first impression was she's not my type. Little did I know. Okay? <laughs> All right, little did I know, what was going through her mind was exactly the same thought. She looked at me and said, no, it's not my time. <laughs> no. Why? Because opposites do attract. Okay? You survey a lot of the married couples and they are opposites of each other. Okay? <laughs> they was laughing. <laughs> Right? And that's why sometimes we struggle with that because it's like, how is this going to work? It was, it was like poles apart. We're totally different from each other. You know, we spend our time fighting or disagreeing or whatever. And yet there is an irresistible draw okay, between these two. Now, <laughs> okay, now her gratitude. Look at her gratitude towards boys. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. Right? Gratitude to, for 
Boaz for granting favor to her, gratitude for his comforting words of encouragement. It says, For that thou hast comforted me. Okay, the, the language between the two is still very polite, all right, but very friendly. And she says, Thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaiden, though I be not like one of thine own handmaidens. Right? She's grateful for his comforting words, grateful for his friendship, even though she's a foreigner. She's a Moabitess. She doesn't look like the others. Okay? Now, remember, she has had a tough life for a person so young. Now, what happens a lot of times is this, hurting people, they don't respond this way. Right? They respond in an angry way. Sometimes I, I don't look, boys. I don't need your help. I don't need your charity. What are you trying to do? Right? You can just keep all those to yourself. You know what? Just stay out of my business here. She didn't do that. All right? How do we express gratitude towards people who do things for us and help us? This is something forgotten among God's people these days. Okay when we ought to constantly be expressing gratitude. Like Boaz, what did he do? He, one of the things he did with respect to Ruth was what? He gave praise where praise was due. Yeah, I know, Asians, we like, oh, we don't want to praise. In case like, their head swells up with pride, whatever. You know, there is a time for praise and where it's due, do it. It encourages others. All right, but don't do it in order to make someone faithful. If they're not faithful, you don't offer empty praise. Okay? Now, this is exchange is going on between the two of them, right? And then now he extends his generous generosity and hospitality. Right? He invites her for dinner with his other workers. Verse 14. And boys said unto her, At mealtime, come down hither and eat of the bread. Okay? Join my workers. Right? Sit down and eat. Don't worry. We have enough food. Join us. Okay? People develop a lot of closeness over what? Meals. Right? We do that. Right? Especially at camp also. And then it says, and dip thy morsel into the vinegar. It says, dip whatever your bread, whatever into the same vinegar with everyone. Okay? Again, remember, she's a Gentile. It's very easy for the minds of many to say, no, no, you're a gentile. Okay, you, you have a separate one. Hey, you don't dip into the same okay, vinegar as the rest of us. And she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. All right, so he... Okay, now the, the law of God forbids, all right, this okay now you're not supposed to do this with unbelievers but he did not treat her as second class treated her as a even though she was foreigner all right why she is a believer there is no second class church member all right and then notice the the grain that she gleaned what did boys do he took some of he reached in right the grain that she had taken Okay, she had gleaned. He took some of that and he went and he toasted that. He roasted the... So that she could eat that. <laughs> He's a gentleman. Yeah? But at the same time, you notice, very interesting, because now, think about what's happening at the meal, right? He could have used his own grain roasted that and given it to her he didn't do that he reached in to the grain that she had gleaned through her own effort and then roasted that for her so that she will eat of the labor of uh, eat of her own labor rather than him just handing out a free meal okay and one of the things we have to remember is There are going to be people in need, and at the same time, we need to help them to help themselves. 
okay? To help them to help themselves, to give them opportunities where by their own labor and work however, so that why? Because when people work for them, when they people work for themselves and provide for themselves through their work, it gives them dignity. When we just give stuff out freely, that they they did not have to work or labor for it, we rob them of that dignity. Okay, we rob them also their their pride, so to speak. Okay, I mean it in a positive way. Now, notice, he's taken, I think, an interest and a liking to her, and he secretly helps Ruth. Okay, now by allowing her to glean without interference among the sheep. Now, look at verse 15. And when she was risen up to glean, right? So this is after the meal, right? They all sat down together to eat and whatever. They spent time around, uh, around food. Now, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheep and reproach her not. Okay, now there was, concerning gleaning, it was supposed to be whatever drops down, but it says, okay, whatever's left behind and it was not plucked or whatever, it says, it's okay, just let her glean from there. Don't stop her. All right. Now, can you see how Boaz is was impressed by Ruth and her attitude and her spirit that he is now secretly helping her? We thank God for that. That there are brethren among us that sometimes they know that you and I have a need or we're going through a tough time or whatever. And sometimes they don't want to embarrass us or whatever, but in helping us, sometimes maybe they will just leave something at the door. Right? Uh, you know, I love it when the brethren do that for one another in our church. And, you know, there will be an offering and it's not always to the pastor. Right? An offering and they put someone's name there or whatever and nobody knows who it came from. But you have a secret friend there somewhere. And they are cheering you on, they are praying for you, and they are encouraging you. They know you're going through a difficult time. Okay? And they are doing that. Now, now he goes one step further. Look at verse 16. Boaz continues to, in his secret acts of kindness, now verse 16 says, and let some, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Alright? Now, here's the picture. Boaz is doing everything in his power to help her without stripping her of her dignity. Alright? She, she, all she was seeking for is the right to work. Alright? And what happens now? He is conspiring behind the scenes, telling his workers, all right, if she gleans among the sheep, leave her alone. Let her do it. All right? And when you carry your grain, your, your corn and whatever, you know, just accidentally on purpose, drop some on the ground to let her pick it up. Accidentally on purpose. Yeah, I, I heard this. I don't know to what extent it's true. I heard this that in one church, um, the Preacher boys, the Bible school students, uh, do the cleaning up in church on Monday morning. So as they're cleaning up the pews and all that, there are people who accidentally on purpose leave their wallets behind or leave money behind and they drop it. Knowing that, okay, the students have needs. Now, what he's doing now is he's helping her without taking anything away from her. And I want us to see here when you get to verse 17 that it doesn't change her because so she gleaned in the field until even, until the evening. And beat out that she had gleaned and it was about an ifa of Bali. Okay? God's way has always been that we work for our needs. The world's way today is that where there are needs, okay, we meet those needs without requiring people to work. What we will do is we will tax all those who are working to give to those people who are not working. Okay, now those who are not working, there are two groups. 
those who are unable to find work and another group which is a growing group around the world is those who don't want to work the Bible is very clear, right? That if any man does not work, neither shall he eat. Why? Because hunger is a very good teacher. Yeah? It will teach you to work very quickly. It will teach you not to be foolish about the way you spend your money also. I learned not to be foolish about my money when I went hungry as a high school student. Why? Because I mismanaged all my money. I ran out of money. And when I went out with my friend, when we sat down at McDonald's and he was eating, and halfway through while he was eating, he realized I had no food. And he says, aren't you eating? And that was when I had to eat my pride and say, uh, I ran out of money. Oh, why didn't you tell me earlier? He gave me the burger now. This was about a piece this big, what's left. And you know something? I was hungry. I had to swallow my pride and eat that small piece which he had been eating. Otherwise, I would go hungry for the rest of the day. Now, I never made that mistake again. Never. Why? Because hunger is a good teacher. It teaches you not to be foolish with your money. It also teaches you to work. Okay? The problem today also as parents that we are very quick to shield our children from consequences. They never learn. Consequences are a very good teacher even when they're this young. Okay, there's some things I will not shield them. I want them to learn by the hard way and then they will never forget that lesson. As long as it's not fatal. Okay, and as long as it doesn't send them to a hospital. But some things they were going to have to learn. Now, so what do we see here? That as we wrap up, realize our churches can be very different. Right? If we season everything with charity and kindness, okay, and that especially among the New Testament saints, there the love and kindness is uncommon as far as the world is concerned. It's different. And by the way, it ought to be different. That's why our Lord said, well, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have loved one, toward another and so the question we need to ask ourselves is okay what is the kind of atmosphere or charity that we have among us okay we say we're brethren that means we're brothers and sisters are we as close as that as brothers and sisters hmm? how is your love towards one another how do we speak to one another all right Beginning from the pastor and you know the deacons and the leaders, whoever, how do we speak to other people? How do we treat them? Especially those that maybe are not in a position to, like I said, to repay us. Right? Our kindness. You see, Boaz was not like that. He he did not see that kind of division. And he was very kind uh, towards Ruth, who is a new believer. Okay? He encouraged her. He knows this is not a difficult not an easy thing that she's doing it's difficult but he did not try to take away the need for her to work right he continued to encourage her but he secretly helped her along without taking away anything without robbing her of her dignity okay now there are many lessons here that I think we, we see that we can pick up in terms of how we should be a blessing to others my question is this, are you a blessing to others are you an encouragement to others all right are you sensitive to that somebody may not be having an easy time in church and they are in need of encouragement of help and of our ministry of prayer all right how do we do it without taking away their Dignity. Sometimes, some things, it's difficult to share that as a prayer request without putting someone on the spot and embarrassing them. But you know, if we know, we can always quietly, secretly, just mobilize people to pray for that person. 
We don't have to get into all the details. We don't have to know everything. All right. And how do we make others feel welcome? All right. Every one of these things among God's people is rare and very different from the world. Okay. Now, if we could lay that as a part of the groundwork there, along with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think it will make a huge difference. Right? It will make a huge difference in our ministries. And among ourselves, you know, not only will we be a blessing to others, I believe we will in turn be blessed also. Okay? Like I said, it's pictured in the Lord's Supper. The unity, the intimacy of the relationship and the fellowship of the members it cannot be divided it is that close the same bread same cup right and today maybe some of us here we need to change our heart our attitude towards one another okay but determine let it start with myself first right you'll be the one to make the first move just as Boaz saw the situation, he saw the need, and then he made the move. All right, and this will lay set in motion a whole series of things that will now create something amazing as we get to the end of the Book of Ruth. All right, a determined I will be the one. Let me let it start with me. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for showing to us. This uncommon love and grace that exists and charity that exists among the, your people. I pray and ask that you help us to determine that we want to be people like that. We will be those who will praise appropriately and offer encouragement and help, whether in kind or in prayer or in terms of encouragement. And that we will be hospitable and, and help feel, help everyone be welcome. Lord, that we will fulfill this desire of our Lord that we will have a special love that the world cannot understand, even among the brethren. Lord, help us to be mindful and sensitive to the needs of others and to be, that realize that maybe someone who is hurting and someone who has needs and someone who needs help or needs encouragement that we will be the first ones proactive about doing something. And in, our, in every little way, that there are things that we, you can use us for. Help us, Lord, to surrender ourselves, to be you, to be your instruments of love, charity, and kindness. Have your way with us. I pray you help us to be responsive, even in this time of invitation. And we ask this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor.